Well, I came across this, um, this article from a very sophisticated, reliable source called BuzzFeed.com. Um, <laughs> you can tell the quality of my reading. But anyway, uh, this article asked this one question. What would you be willing to do for a million dollars? They said everybody has a prize. What would you be willing to do for a million dollars? Now, I'm going to show you the list from that website, but I want to apologize first if this is a little uh, gross or, you know, it's just gro gross you out and stuff like that. But I take this from that website, okay? So um, uh, uh, I apologize ahead of time. Would you be willing to suck on this toe for a million dollars? Yeah, yeah, somebody's fair enough. A million dollar? Come on, right? Would you be willing? <laughs> Would you be willing to eat a bowl of hair that was just pulled out from your bathtub drain for a million dollar? Yeah, yeah, a million dollar? Come on. Would you be willing to lick this? Toilet here, this in the <laughs> for a million dollar, right? Would you be willing to drink the tea that was made from these dirty socks when you brew it? You put the tea in the dirty socks for every day for a week. <laughs> Would you be willing? You know, if you go to the dumpsters, you go to the trash can, a lot of times, you know, it's, uh, there's that liquid that was on the bottom of the dumpster. Ah, yeah, I know, right? Would you be willing to take a shot of that for a million dollars? No? No? Okay, here's the last one. Yeah, I take it exactly from the, the website. Would you be willing to eat this fresh dog poop? I don't know why they have to put fresh dog poop, right? Is it because it's still warm and soft? And okay, let's let's move on. Okay, well, we are continuing our series called Heart Check. This is the series. This is actually the third part of our series, right? We said that you know, if you go to the hospital, doctor office to check your physical heart, there's all kind of procedure, EKG, stress tests, and all kind of different procedures to check on for your physical uh, heart, right? But what we are asking in this series, what do we do? What do we use to check on our spiritual heart, the condition of human heart, right? Because we said this that our heart actually have enemies. Do you know that? And we give you the list here. Here's, here are some of the topics that we've been talking about in the past couple of weeks. Here are the enemies of human heart. Anger, guilt. We talked about that in the previous two weeks. Today we're going to talk about greed, right? Um, and then next week, I still haven't decided whether we're going to talk about jealousy or pride. The Bible says this. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Jesus said, the word you speak come from the heart, and that's what defiles you, right? Jesus said, the word that come out of us reveal the condition of our heart, right? And the reason why we're talking about this is because, again, it says that we need to guard our heart, right, above all else. Guarding our eyes is important. Guarding our ears, our mouth, those are important things to do. But above all else, guard your heart. Why? Because from it flow all kind of things. Because the condition of our heart determine the direction of our life. Determine where we're going to end up. Determine the destination where we're going to end up, right? That's what the Bible teaches us. Now, today, like I said, we're going to talk about greed. Now, when we talk about greed, you know, we have to talk about money. And I know it's a very tricky thing when we talk about money, the issue of money in the church, right? Some of you sitting here, man, I come in on the wrong Sunday, of, you know, to church, right? But here's something that I've been thinking about greed, right? Why is it greed? It's, it, why is it it's so hard to detect in our heart, right? In other words, us, you and me, right? None of us says this, well, I, I just struggle with greed, right? When we look at ourselves in the mirror, it's, it, none of us, almost none of us says that I'm, I'm just struggling with greed, right? Why is it so hard to detect it in our heart? It's hard to see in the mirror, right? It's easy to spot on other people, right? Man, that people is just never feel that they have enough. You know, they are greedy, right? But when it comes to spotting in our heart, it is very difficult. 
Now, I think, I, I, this is, I don't know if you agree with this, you're welcome to disagree, but I think a lot of times we cover greed with like, with good virtues, if you will, right? We, we, we say something like this, I'm not greedy, I'm just a saver. I'm not greedy, I'm just careful with money, right? I'm not greedy, I'm just a planner, I'm just, I'm just preparing for my future. Now, all of those things are good. I hope you have some type of saving, I hope you have some type of plan for your future, right? But I've been thinking this, is it possible for all of us to prepare for every imagine, imaginable scenarios in our life, right? What if I lose my job? What if the economy is? What if I got sick, right? I just got to make sure I'm secured and all of that. Is it possible? I'm afraid that, you know, if we are not careful, we are trying to protect ourselves from every imaginable scenarios to the point where we are insensitive to the need of others around us. Are you still with me, church? Right? We, we, we're trying to be careful. We're trying to, you know, like, again, it, it gets to the point where, again, we, it, our heart it becomes so hard, right? Uh, our heart is hardened in, or in terms of meeting the need that we can meet of the people around us. Right? And, and, and oftentimes, maybe we don't realize this, that greed oftentimes fueled by fear. Maybe some of us growing up, we don't have a lot, Right? Maybe we're growing up poor, right? And we never want to go back. We, we hate that feeling of, of, you know, being poor, right? And we never want to go back to that situation. And, you know, just that fear of not having enough, right? And as a result, it costs us to live our life with close hand, right? Maybe it's fueled by fear. And here's another thing that I observe. Again, you may disagree. But greed, right, can happen to anyone. In other words, it's this, it does not depend on the socioeconomic, uh, you know, status of someone, right? You, you, you probably meet uh, poor, greedy people. You probably meet uh, middle uh, class, greedy people. And you, you definitely think that all the wealthy people are, are greedy, right? Which convinced me, when, when I'm thinking about greed and all of the things that I just said, right? Greed is not so much about financial problem, but it is a hard problem. Now, here's a question, a simple question. That I think in all of you, I know the answer to this. How much is enough? I think you know the answer to that. I know the answer to that. How much is enough? Right? And, and the answer to this, how much is enough? And the answer is always this, a little bit more. Right? We all know the answer. Right? A little bit more than what I currently have, a little bit more than what I, I can currently save, a little bit more than I currently make at my job, right? There's an interesting research by Gallup. There's a poll that was done by Gallup. He was asking people, hey, how much is enough? And then they asked the, the group of people who make about $30,000 a year, hey, how much is enough for you? And they said, if I make double of that, like $74, I mean $74,000 a year, then there would be enough. And then they go to the people who make $50,000 a year. And they, those people say, if I can make about $100,000, that would be enough. Well, then I will feel okay, right? And then they went to the top income earners. I mean, these are the people who make close to a million dollar a year, eight hundred, nine hundred thousand dollar a year, right? And they said, if I have a total assets of five million dollars, then that would be enough. Then I will feel rich, right? And which got me thinking. So if you only have two million dollar in total assets, you're not gonna feel rich, right? How much is enough, right? How much is enough? How much is enough to make you feel secure, to make you feel that you have enough, right? And the answer is always more. Well, here's the thing about more. More is a moving line, right? More is a moving target. We think once we make $50,000 a year, $100,000 a year, we would be enough. When we arrive, oops, I need a little bit more, right? 
Now, today, I'm not going to, I know that usually when you hear about money being preached in the church, right, uh, you know, we, the preacher, we always have a way to make you feel bad, right? Hey, do you know that the rest of the world live only in two, on $2 a day, right? We give you all that statistic. Hey, do you know that if you make $30,000, you are in the top 1% of income uh, uh, earners in the world, right? If you have a car, you are in the top 15% of the whole population in the world, right? And you, which you're going to tell me, well, I don't live in the, right, you know, in the other country. I live in the U.S., which everything is expensive, right? So I, it's fair enough. It's fair enough. But, but you know what? I feel very fortunate as someone, me personally, as someone who lived in Indonesia for the first 16 years of my life, and then in the last 27 years, I live in the United States, in, in the U.S., right? This really helped me put things in perspective, right? It definitely helped me just to be aware of things. It, it stay grounded, if you will, right? Especially when I start complaining. Hey, you, you know, when, you know you, have you ever heard the rich people complaining, right? My Wi-Fi is not working. My Netflix account is not working, right? Man, my, my Air Jordan came a couple days late, right? And when I start feeling entitled, I deserved it, and I deserved that, it really helped me. So I feel very fortunate. So maybe for those of you who never have a, a picture or never live, have the experience to live in another country, maybe uh, you, you don't know uh, that, 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 that perspective. But I personally feel very uh, fortunate because I have that experience. Now today, I want to take you to this parable that Jesus shared. Um, if you don't know what a parable is, it's usually when Jesus teach, he liked to use illustration. He, he liked to use uh, a made up story, but, but inside of that story, there's a real lesson. There's a, a, a real value of the kingdom of heaven value, right? There's a real uh, kingdom of heaven uh, principle. So one time, Jesus was teaching the people about the Holy Spirit, right? The topic of the Holy Spirit. And then in the middle of him teaching, just maybe like, like this, maybe a lot more people, thousands of people, right? Somebody interrupted him, right? And this is what exactly happened. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. So in the middle of teaching, someone interrupted him. Now, again, I don't know what happened. Maybe Jesus was preaching too long, right? Uh, this guy is like, he's so restless. I mean, he has a question. He was planning to ask Jesus maybe after the service, but Jesus is going on and on and on. And finally, he cannot wait anymore. He just interrupted Jesus. Hey, Jesus, can you tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me? And then Jesus replied to that man, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you. In other words, why are you coming to me to settle this thing between you and your brother? I just think it's very interesting, isn't it, right? Jesus teach, you know, trying to teach about some princi uh, spiritual principles, uh, you know, some, some type of spiritual thing, you know, the, the Holy Spirit. And then this guy would like to just jump in into the topic of money. You know, after all, you know, we, we probably are a, a little bit similar to this guy, right? We go like, okay, Bible is important, God is important, but God cannot pay my rent. God cannot buy me groceries. God cannot pay my credit card, right? Right? So chop, chop, you know, let's get to the core of the issue. Money. Let's talk about money, right? And no wonder in Matthew 6, I don't have the verse up here, Jesus says that the number one competitor, the chief competitor of God capturing human heart it's not demon, it's not devil, it's not evil spirit, it's money and stuff in Matthew 6. Isn't it interesting? Jesus said you cannot serve both God and money. He doesn't say you cannot serve both God and the devil, right? And this is the brilliance of Jesus. As he was talking about Holy Spirit, someone come up with that question and he switched the topic, right? He switched the topic from talking about Holy Spirit he to, to talking about money and possession, right? That's why I said he's brilliant because if you yell out something, right, and I go like, okay, we'll talk after the service. My note is about this. I cannot change my topic, right? But anyway, he said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kind of, help me out, church, all kind of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possession. It's not enough to watch out, but be on your guard against all kind of greed, right? 
Jesus know the heart of man. He went straight to the root of the issue. And Jesus used this opportunity not just to address that one person, but to the whole crowd. Be careful, watch out, be on guard against all kind of greed. Hey, life does not consist in an abundance of possession. Jesus made a statement that really um, uh, forced us to just reflect and, and, and just take a step back a little bit in life. How do we define life? Is life equal stuff? Is life equal stuff that we have? We own the, how much money we have in the bank, how big our property, how big our 401k, how big our network, network right? Is it really that life is about that? And we all kind of know the answer. No, that, those things does not, do not define my life. Life is so much more than just life equal possession, life equal money. But yet, interestingly, we live our life every day like that's like, like life equal possession, right? We spend, we save, we close our hand, we accumulate things, right? And then Jesus go into the parable, and he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He said, that, hey, guys, there's this very successful businessman in the business of agriculture, right? And he said that, you know, and, and this guy just hit a record-breaking year, a record-breaking number, right? A rec record-breaking harvest. And then this guy, Jesus says, started to talk to himself. Verse 17 says that he thought to himself, this, this very successful businessman, and I want you to fair, uh, pay attention here. In the next three verses, I'm going to stress the word I, right? And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. There I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you or I have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, drink, and be merry. If, I'm not, if, I don't, if I didn't miscalculate it, he was referring to I, mine, uh, mine, myself, more than 10 times, right? One day he just looked at everything that he has, all the things that he has, and he's thinking to, to, to himself, man, I have a lot. And the first thing that he thought about, I need to build a bigger storage unit to fit all of the things that I own, all of the things that I have so that I can take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. Honestly, that's what we were aiming for, right? We cannot wait to stop going to our nine-to-five job, right? Where we cannot wait to just take life, you know, eat, drink, and be merry, right? So that we can settle, we can stop going to our, you know, we just, you know, but, but again, more is moving target. The, the number is moving target. The things that we target, man, if I just have this much, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop working. I'm, you know, I'm, I don't have to do this anymore. But when we get there, it's a moving target, right? And God said to this man, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? I mean, this guy obviously is a very savvy businessman, right? I mean, he's good at like calculating, forecasting, projecting his business. He thinks that, man, if, I'm a, if, if my business continues to grow, I need a place to store all of the stuff that I, I, I accumulate. So he's doing some calculation, but he made a major miscalculation. He forgot to factor in this thing called time in this world. This very night, Jesus said, your life will be demanded for you. And you don't get to enjoy the things that you work hard, by the way, that you work hard for. Somebody else will enjoy it. And Jesus concluded by saying this, this is how it will be with whoever store up things for themselves, but is not rich toward You know, the, the conclusion actually um, uh, helped us to know 
that being productive, being successful, these are not the problems, right? Nothing wrong with the money itself, right? It's not a sin to work hard. It's not a sin to be rich. It's not a sin to be productive. It is not a sin. That's not the problem. The problem, the term that God, the, the term that Jesus used is that this guy is not rich toward God. What does that even mean? Right? What Jesus had issue with this guy is that this man store up things for himself. In other words, he just assumed that everything he has, he owned, right, is for himself. And to borrow a statement from someone named Pastor Andy Stanley, he defined greed this way. Greed is the assumption that it is all for my consumption. When he has more, when he was blessed with more, when his harvest hit a record-breaking number, the first thing that he assumed that all of those are his. Greed is when we assume that everything we own, everything we make, everything that comes our way, everything that hit our bank account, was everything that was placed in my hand, as all for my consumption. It is all for me. That's what Jesus takes issue with. The word that he used, that it is not rich toward God. I think rich toward God, when Jesus said this, it means that rich in good work, right? Uh, generosity, right? There's no other way around. I, I put it this way. The antidote, the cure, the solution to greed is generosity. These two things is the total opposite between greed and generosity. This is the antidote of greed. There's no way around this. Again, warning, like I said in the beginning, nobody look at ourselves in the mirror and say, I struggle with greed. But the, 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 the measurement, whether we are greedy or not, I know it's a very strong word, is by looking at how generous we are. Now, again, when we're talking about generosity, I know we all have different defini definition. We all have different picture of what generosity means, right? I mean, if we, uh, you know, give a dollar to someone in the traffic light or in front of someone who is in front of CVS or Dunkin' Donut, you know, you give a dollar, right? That's generous. That's generous. I hope you keep doing it if you like to do it. But I personally think that generosity, or using the term of Jesus, rich toward God, it's so much more than giving here and there. It's so much more than just the, a random act of kindness, random giving. So, so I want to close with this. I have a couple minutes left. I, wanna, I, wanna, I don't know if you're aware, but do you know that most people, the majority of the people, at least in this country, this is the way they manage their money, right? When they get money, they spend, they pay debt, they pay tax. Hopefully, you, you pay tax, right? And then if we have left leftover, uh, left we, we, we save. And then if we have leftover, then we give, right? We spend, you know, uh, you know rent, bill, uh, pay debt, you know, the, the, the car payment, the, you know, that 24 months iPhone 15 payment, right? That, um, <laughs> that, that 24 months laptop from Best Buy, right? You, right? And then we pay tax, right? And then if we have leftover, we save. And we have, if we have leftover, then we give. But if, you, if we simplify this, the majority of the people, this is how we manage our money. For me, for me, wait, no, 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 go back. For me and for me, right? If I have leftover, I'll save it for my future. And then the last one, if I have leftover, I'll share it with other people. He, here's some old statistic that I want to show you. And I'm sure the new one is definitely worse than this. But this is the old statistic that I came across. That you know that the average people in this country spend 136%, save 4 to 5%, and give 2 to 3%. Right? Are you asking me, Sam, is that a typo? Did you accidentally uh, mistype that? No, 136% they're spending. That means they spend more than they may, right? Starting last year, 2023, the total credit card debt in this country go over $1 trillion. With a T, by the way, not a B. Go over one, the total amount of credit card debt. Man, I don't know about you, but at some point, we all need to say enough is enough, right? 
I'm tired of living this way, man. I'm tired of living just in this, this cycle, right? I'm tired of living in fear. What if, what if, what if, what if I don't have enough? What if, what if, what if, right? What if this? You know, I'm tired of living this way. This is why the more I talk about it, the more I think about it, the more I study it, that money is not about math. Money is not just about number. If it's just about math, then this is not going to happen, right? Because the basic math says that we not even shouldn't spend more than we make, right? If money is about math, then our nation, our family, us as an individual will not be in trouble. And that is why Jesus invited us. I want to invite you, Jesus says, to reorder, right, the way you manage your money. The majority of the people manage their money, spend, save, and give. And Jesus invited you to flip the order, right? What if anytime something coming our way, we set it aside right away to give, and then we save, and then we live on the rest. I want to tell you a story. Hopefully, it's not going to go too long. In 2005, again, this is not a, 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 a picture perfect of, of what you should do, but this is just our journey and our personal experience. In 2005, I gave my life to Jesus and became a Christian. And I learned this concept of tithing which the Bible teaches to set aside 10% of our income. And we've been, I've personally been doing that when I gave my life to Jesus. And then in 2011, me and, you know, and Nana, we, we got married, right? Um, uh, you know, I wasn't a pastor then. And I remember this, uh, me and Nana, we used to uh, have our offering, right? We pray on Saturday night, God, tomorrow we're going to church, right? This is, this is what we have for you. This is our offering for you and stuff like that, right? Can I be honest with you? We don't even pray that anymore. Everything becomes so automatic. We don't even think about it. We take the emotion out of it. You know why? Because we have pre-decided. We have pre-planned. We have a system. We have a priority. Right? And we've been doing it for so long. I mean, we are so terrible with consistency. There's nothing in our life is consistent. Working out, eating healthy, nothing is consistent. If there's one thing that we can do consistent, this is something that we've been doing very consistent. We are not waiting until we have leftover. Come on, who are we kidding, right? If we are waiting until we have leftover, we barely have leftover. I want you to pay attention to this video here. And then I promise I'll be done. If you can get it ready, please, the, the sound and everything. It's a short video. It's a 17-second video. So, Melody, if Daddy give you money, what do you do? What is, what is the first thing that you do? Um, I give this to God, and I keep it, and I, and I, and I use it. Use it. Good. Bye, guys. Um, that video is from 2016. She was three years old. Now she's 11 years old. That's my daughter, Melody. This is not something that I teach, that I talk about it. This is something that I truly, truly believe. Now our two kids, every time they have birthday or since we're um, Asian, right? Sometimes we, uh, every year we celebrate Chinese New Year when you get red, red envelope. Come on, make some noise for red envelope, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? My wife, Nana, will sit them down, gather all that money that they got, count it, total it, and then she will tell them to set it aside, grab the envelope, put your name on it, and give it. Why are we teaching them this? Is it because the church wants their money? Is it because God wants their money? Right? I don't need their money. I can just take it from them. They're not going to be able to do anything. The real reason why we want to plant this habit in them, we don't want them to grow up enslaved with this thing called more. Just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. And that's what we don't want to happen to our children. Today's message, I'm encouraging you to, 
Jesus and me, I'm encouraging you to reorder your finance. Not, I'm not promising anything in this message. I'm not, I never said that if you give $100, God will give you $1,000, right? If you tithe of your, you set aside 10% of your income, God will give you a car and a house. Never make that promise. But you know the promise that I can make? That I can boldly make to you. If you accept the invitation to reorder your finance, to prioritize giving, to prioritize gener generosity, to be rich toward God, something will start happening in your heart and to your heart. You know that grip will start loosening up a little bit, right? And eventually will, that grip will, you will, 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 you will be free from that grip. The worry of what if, what if, what if, what if, what if will turn into peace. The fear of not having enough will turn to trust in God. And finally, something happened to your hand. You know, you live with this hand right here, and then the hand will start it to open, right? I'll leave you with this first, 1 Timothy 6, verse 17. Command those who are rich in this present world. And that's the problem. We don't feel like we're rich, right? If I ask you how many of you are rich, nobody will raise our hand, right? But we have plenty, you know, not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. But to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. We won't be able to enjoy our life if we are still enslaved with a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. We don't put our hope in riches, but we put our hope in the one who richly provides. I'll repeat that for you. We don't put our hope in riches, but we put our hope in the one who richly provides. Can I invite all of you to stand up? I apologize, so I go over a little bit there. Allow me to pray for you. Father God, um, thank you, Lord. Thank you just for a reminder for all of us. This one thing called greed is so hard to detect in our heart. God, give us the strength, give us the courage to live differently than this world. God, help us and free us from the slavery of more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And teach us to be generous. Teach us, Lord, to be aware and to be sensitive to the need of the people around us. Thank you, Lord. And teach us to realize that this is the heart of God. For God so loved the world and He gave. He gave His one and only Son so that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. At the core of your heart, it's giving. So we thank you for that reminder, Lord. Whatever it looks like, and no matter what it looks like in our life, just help us just to have the courage again to reorder, reprioritize whatever that we need to do and give us wisdom. And we know, and help us realize that we are the owner of nothing and the steward of everything, everything that comes our way, everything that was placed in our hand, those are from you, and we are called to steward it. We love you, Lord. I speak blessing over all of us. May the good thing and the perfect thing that comes from heaven will fall on us and will follow us for the rest of our life. Lord, the favor, the blessing will come our way. And we speak grace, peace, and joy will fulfill our life. In Jesus' name we pray. All of us say, amen, amen, amen. Thank you all for being here. I'll see you guys next week. Have a great Sunday.